With just a week to go until the Electoral College votes on the next president, the Trump campaign is running out of time and options in efforts to overturn results of the presidential election. On Sunday, Georgia's Republican state leadership publicly declined Mr. Trump's call to convene a special legislative session to overturn the election results in the state. Monday morning, a federal judge rejected a push from Michigan Republicans to declare President Trump the winner in the state, saying the effort aimed to, quote, ignore the will of millions of voters. Since Friday, the Trump campaign and their Republican allies have lost legal cases in six different states. On top of that, Rudy Giuliani, the head of the Trump campaign's legal effort, has tested positive for COVID-19. The 76-year-old is reportedly hospitalized, hospitalized in Washington. He took over the election legal challenges after his predecessor, Corey Lewandowski, contracted the virus last month. Giuliani's diagnosis follows weeks of traveling to, contest, to contest the November results through the court. Last week, he spoke in Arizona, Georgia, and Michigan, often without covering his face. The Arizona legislature even shut down after GOP lawmakers spent two days with Giuliani. President Trump wished Giuliani well while continuing to deny his defeat earlier. Rudy is doing well. I just spoke to him. He's doing very well. No temperature. And uh, he actually called me early this morning. It was the first call I got. Now he's doing very well. At, at this point, are you looking to change the outcome of the election or try to make a case to the American people that it wasn't fair? Well, I think the uh, case has already been made if you look at the polls. Uh, it was a rigged election. Uh, you look at the different states, the election was totally rigged. Uh, it's a disgrace to our country. It's like a third world country. And I think the case has been made, and now we find out what we can do about it. But you'll see a lot of big things happening over the next couple of days. President-elect Joe Biden had nothing on his schedule Monday as he prepares to introduce the next batch of nominees for his administration. First, he announced his foreign policy staff, then his economic team. Tuesday, he's rolling out his health advisors. California Attorney General Javier Becerra is the latest cabinet announcement. He is Mr. Biden's choice to lead the Department of Health and Human Services. Former Surgeon General under President Obama, Dr. Vivek Murthy, will be nominated for his old job. And Dr. Anthony Fauci, the government's top infectious disease expert, was selected to be chief medical advisor. The president-elect's announcements come as U.S. hospitals continue to fill up with coronavirus patients. More than 101,000 people across the country were hospitalized with COVID-19 as of Sunday, the most since the pandemic began. Since November, hospitalization rates are dropping as cases continue to rise because fewer people are being admitted as hospital beds fill up in hard-hit areas. In an interview with CBS Evening News anchor Nora O'Donnell, Dr. Fauci warned these numbers don't yet include the impact of Thanksgiving travel. I didn't ever think we'd hit the uh, number that we would be averaging 200,000 cases on a seven-day average, which is where we are now. It's just hard to believe in many ways. Do you see this as a direct result of Thanksgiving, that surge that you warned about? Not yet, Nora. I think that the, the numbers we're seeing now might in, in part be due a bit, but the full brunt of the Thanksgiving has not yet been felt. It's usually two to two and a half weeks following the event. Nicole Killian, Caitlin Huey Burns, and Eugene Scott join me now. Nicole is a CBS News correspondent with the president elect in Delaware. Caitlin is CBSN's political reporter. And Eugene is a political reporter for The Washington Post and host of the podcast The Next Four Years. Welcome. It's great to see you all. Eugene, let me begin with you. As we see the state of the pandemic continue to worsen as we head into winter, the country is still waiting on Congress to see if an aid package will place the one expiring. Now, they have a big week of deadlines on government and military fundings, but it sounds like lawmakers are pushing those back. It does, and that's uh, to be expected to some degree, considering how difficult of a time uh, the lawmakers have had even getting this far. Uh, and that's been quite frustrating to many families. Uh, obviously, as we head into the holiday season, there are new challenges that come uh, with having limited resources or unemployment altogether. 
uh, that many Americans have been making uh, well known in public to their lawmakers. Uh, Housing costs, uh, food costs, heating, uh, shelter, and clothing are, are all essential needs and issues that uh, become even more uh, essential during this time of year. And so we've seen lawmakers try to make an effort to uh, pass perhaps some temporary uh, relief, uh, but we all know that that's going to be insufficient based on the conversations those of us have had on the ground with Americans who are really struggling and have been for most of this year to put food on the table as a result of the economic downturn. And Nicole, let me turn to you. Just this afternoon, President-elect Biden said that his picks for Attorney General and Secretary of Defense are coming this week. As we await those, uh, talk to us, Nicole, about Mr. Biden's choice to lead the Department of Health and Human Services, Javier Becerra. What kind of experience does he have, and what relationships does he have on Capitol Hill? Well, he has some pretty strong relationships on Capitol Hill, considering he served in Congress for a number of years and kind of rose through the leadership ranks. And even though for uh, the last several years now he has served as California's attorney general, uh, he did during his time in Congress help shepherd uh, the Affordable Care Act. And as he tweeted today in his capacity as uh, attorney general of the state of California, he defended it in court a number of times. Uh, so uh, that is uh, some of the experience experience that he brings uh, to the agency if he is confirmed. You know, there is also, uh, of course, uh, a push or has been a push uh, to also make sure that the president-elect uh, diversifies his cabinet. And you'll recall just a couple of days ago, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, met with the transition to push for greater representation. So uh, while they are cheering this pick of Javier Becerra, uh, there are others, too, who feel that his voice, his lived experiences as a son of Mexican immigrants can also be valuable in terms of tackling the pandemic more specifically when you look at the issue of health disparities, uh, which will be very critical uh, for this administration to address. Uh, so many also see him as an asset in that sense as well. Meantime, Caitlin, the U.S. Supreme Court is moving up a key deadline for Pennsylvania officials to respond to a Republican congressman's efforts to decertify the state's election results. Now, the new deadline coincides with Tuesday's safe harbor deadline for states to choose their slate of electors before the Electoral College votes next Monday. Now, we see these legal windows closing, but President Trump remains defiant in pushing the baseless claim that the election was stolen from him. What impact is it having on the party? Well, I think one of the most telling impacts it's having on the party is that the Washington Post surveyed all 249 Republicans in Congress and only 27 of them acknowledged Biden's victory. And I think the implications of that you're going to see perhaps in Georgia, in that runoff where, where two key Senate races will determine the balance of power in the U.S. Senate. At a debate uh, over the weekend, Kelly Loeffler, one of the incumbent Republicans running for re-election now in that runoff, uh, didn't acknowledge Biden's victory. She sidestepped the question when asked and said that the president has the right to continue these legal challenges. And that's a really uh, potentially uh, challenging and, uh, you know, threatening to their own Republican voters who they are wanting to turn out in a runoff. So on one hand, you have the president, uh, Leffler, and Republicans encouraging people to turn out in Georgia uh, in January to vote in those runoff races. Uh, on the other hand, however, they are saying that the election is rigged and they are not acknowledging the results of the election that were certified again today by uh, the Republican Secretary of State in Georgia after two recounts. Uh, so it is having a potentially an impact on uh, voters that it could end up backfiring on them. And even as recently as this afternoon, the president continued to say, which is not true, that he won this election, even in the Oval Office at that uh, Medal of Freedom ceremony that, that uh, you played from earlier. Eugene, we also know that President Trump is reportedly preparing new sanctions on China, rejecting tougher standards on deadly air pollutants, and ramping up federal executions. How has this transition process impacted the incoming Biden administration? Well, one of the biggest challenges the incoming administration has had has 
it's been that they have not had access to all of the information that one would expect the uh, president-elect to have uh, as early as possible. Uh, there's been challenges making sure that the staff uh, that could replace the uh, existing Trump administration uh, will be as informed and prepared to carry out Biden's agenda on day one. Uh, because they haven't had as many meetings and inter interactions with their predecessors as we usually see. Um, this will uh, possibly create challenges for the Biden administration as they seek to address the coronavirus pandemic and, and revitalize the economy, uh, because there's data and there are conversations and uh, history and perspective that's needed to uh, make decisions that benefit Americans as a whole uh, that just hasn't been made available right now um, at the level we would expect to the Biden administration. Well, Caitlin, we have been seeing President Trump clear out top officials at the Pentagon, and now the New York Times reports Attorney General Bill Barr could potentially be departing the Trump administration before inauguration in just over six weeks. What do we know about this? Right. Well, a DOJ official had told CBS News that the attorney general plans to stay on as long as the president will have him. Uh, we know that the president was uh, upset at Barr for comments that he made uh, to the Associated Press, saying that there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud at the scale that the president was alleging, and certainly not uh, to uh, overturn the election. The president and his reelection team argued, uh, again, without any evidence uh, that that Barr was incorrect and didn't wage a proper investigation. So that did raise questions about uh, whether the president still had confidence in his attorney general. Uh, there are only about six or seven weeks to go before a new president takes over. So even if uh, Barr was to be let go or to resign, the idea of having a, a another confirmation uh, battle for uh, an attorney general just wouldn't be feasible given the timeline, really. Uh, so they're kind of running uh, running against a, a clock here. Uh, but this comes as the president continues to make these basic, baseless claims, even though his attorney general has said that there uh, just isn't evidence. And that's significant, too, because the attorney general has been uh, supportive of the president and has been a uh, key in implementing uh, many key items of his agenda and has rarely broken with him. Yeah, very rarely broken with him. Well, Nicole, you also broke some news this morning about the chairs of the Biden inaugural committee. Who are they and what do they do? Oh, well, there are a lot of familiar faces and allies to the president-elect if you've been following his campaign. And these are really going to be the people who are tasked with planning and organizing what will truly be an unprecedented inauguration. So uh, the presidential inaugural committee will be led by uh, Chair House uh, Majority Whip Jim Clyburn, also uh, the congressman from South Carolina, who, of course, is a very close Biden ally and was very instrumental, as you recall, in his victory back during the South Carolina primary when he endorsed the president-elect. Uh, he often has uh, the president-elect's ear on a number of issues, uh, including uh, his current selection process as far as cabinet picks go. So he will lead that inaugural committee effort. And then the other co-chairs, are actually former co-chairs of the Biden campaign, which include people like Louisiana Congressman Cedric Richmond, who actually has been also tapped by the president-elect to serve as his senior advisor in the White House and also serve as director of the Office of Public Engagement. There's Delaware Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester, who, of course, is a native of this area and, as I mentioned, a former co-chair of the Biden campaign. And then Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who, of course, has been a very a vocal supporter of the president-elect uh, will be part of this committee, as well as Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. All right, Nicole Killian, Caitlin Huey-Burns, and Eugene Scott, thank you all very much. Appreciate it.